This will be the first series of lectures on metabolism. Uh, I'm going to review first the digestive process in this video, and then we'll look at uh, kind of the general processes of anabolism and catabolism, and then I'll review what's called the Krebs cycle and oxidative phosphorylation in mitochondria. Uh, and then in the subsequent videos, we'll look at specific metabolism of carbohydrates, uh, lipids, and uh, proteins. And then we'll talk a bit about kind of what regulates overall body energy balance, um, how insulin and all the other hormones play into that um, in what's called the absorptive and the post-absorptive states. Um, so that'll be in the following video. So in this video, again, we're going to focus primarily on some of the introductory concepts to metabolism. Uh, this video presupposes that you understand the differences between carbohydrates, uh, proteins, and lipids. So if you're unaware of that, be sure you go back and review that material. So before I talk about general metabolism, let's just quickly review the basic digestive process and what happens to the primary foodstuffs or carbohydrates, proteins, and lipids. Um, I'll talk a bit about vitamins and minerals too as we go here. Um, so of course in the mouth with carbohydrates, we have the action of salivary amylase and that begins the process of starch digestion. So we begin to cleave some of the um, monosaccharides or disaccharides uh, from starches. Uh, there's no significant protein digestion in the mouth. Of course, the process of chewing kind of macerates the food and so forth and gets it prepared for what's gonna happen lower in the GI tract. Um, there is also in the mouth something called lingual lipase. Uh, this is an enzyme secreted by glands in the mouth, and that begins the cleavage of fatty acids from triglycerides. So it kind of begins, preps the process for uh, lipid digestion. Uh, in the stomach, there's no significant carbohydrate digestion. The food is macerated into a big ball, um, and that uh, is mixed with the digestive juices and becomes chyme, remember. So chyme is essentially what your bolus of food becomes as it exits the stomach into the small intestine. Um, in the stomach, of course, we have about 20% of our peptide digestion that occurs via the action of stomach acid and pepsin. Um, and with lipids, no significant uh, lipid digestion there. Uh, in the small intestine, this is where our primary digestion occurs. So regarding carbohydrates, we have pancreatic amylase, which further breaks down the starches into monosaccharides and uh, disaccharides. And then the final step of breaking disaccharides into their individual monosaccharides happens at the brush border. And remember, the brush border enzymes are found in the microvilli uh, uh, in the intestinal enterocytes, the epithelium lining the intestines. Uh, and so we have enzymes like sucrase and lactase and isomaltase, etc., which are going to uh, break down the various different types of disaccharides into monosaccharides. Uh, and then they are absorbed across the enterocytes and will enter the portal vein. And so primarily what the liver will see will be glucose, fructose, and galactose. Uh, and then in the liver, remember that the fructose and galactose are actually converted into glucose. So glucose is our primary end product for carbohydrate digestion. Um, let me just continue on to the large intestine with carbohydrates. Basically, any undigested carbohydrates, uh, undigested starches or uh, oligosaccharides, etc., will uh, be metabolized by gut flora, both in the distal small intestine and in the large intestine. And uh, that will form, tend to form gases like hydrogen, um, hydrogen sulfide, which has more of an odor. That's going to be typical with proteins, not so much carbohydrates, uh, methane, and various alcohols. So interest in the alcoholic fermentation of undigested uh, carbohydrates, uh, that can be absorbed and that can create a sensation of like, wow, I've, I almost feel a little drunk. Um, and some people that have significant fermentation experience that. And that can affect thinking and, and uh, kind of general energy. Um, so, of course, that is to prevent that, we need to have really adequate uh, secretion of these enzymes in the upper GI tract, pancreatic amylase and so forth. Uh, I had connected those ideas with uh, pancreatic insufficiency uh, with the concept in Chinese medicine of spleen qi deficiency. Um, so really they're the same thing. So we want to have adequate sp uh, spleen pancreas activity really to uh, uh, make sure these carbohydrates are being digested where they should be. Um, going back to proteins in the small intestine, uh, about 80% of protein digestion here happens under the action of pancreatic proteases. 
um, and then uh, the dipeptides that result from that will be completely digested into individual amino acids at the brush border again. So these brush border enzymes are very important and we mentioned several conditions like celiac disease uh, and so forth where uh, a chronic inflammatory process in the small intestine causes damage to the enterocytes. Uh, first of all, the villi themselves flatten out, but the microvilli, the tiny uh, you know, uh, surface indentations of the uh, uh, enterocyte, those become damaged and uh, so we lose our brush border enzyme. So we're gonna have problems then digesting carbohydrates and uh, proteins as a result. Um, the individual amino acids then are absorbed across the enterocyte into the portal vein and to the liver. So we have, remember, 20 protein-forming amino acids that are all absorbed this way. Um, any inadequately digested peptides uh, will be then metabolized lower in the gut with gut flora and the compounds that that forms tend to be a lot more sort of smelly and potentially toxic than the compounds from carbohydrates. And that would include things like putrescine and scatol. Um, and uh, scatol is the uh, aromatic uh, protein meta amino acid metabolite that gives rise to kind of the odor of, of feces. Um, and this can create, if there's a lot of it, uh, all of this is absorbed. The liver has to then process all those metabolites. And this is what kind of the older doctors used to call bowel toxemia, where basically the, uh, all those metabolites accumulate in the system and put undue stress on the liver, and then often they're going to have uh, other uh, implications. So um, that's where it's important that we have, again, adequate peptide digestion, as well as adequate clearance of the large intestine. So if there's lots of constipation, all this stuff will tend to ferment and, and be present there longer. Um, in terms of uh, lipids, uh, remember it's the pancreatic lipase, which is then going to cleave fatty acids from triglycerides. Um, and the individual fatty acids then will be surrounded by bile salts and that will form micelles. And the micelles then will be taken up by the enterocytes and inside the enterocyte they are packaged into chylomicrons. Chylomicrons are lipoproteins so they have a lipid um, monolayer, uh, a phospholipid monolayer together with uh, protein studded in the walls and that what's, that's what makes a, a chylomicron. The chylomicron will then enter the lymphatic system and will transport uh, uh, triglycerides directly to the tissues. So that's going to be the sort of overall uh, sort of protein, uh, fat digestion. Um, again, remember that short and medium chain fatty acids, usually under 10 carbons long, are going to enter the portal system and are going to bypass this. But most of our dietary triglycerides will go through the chylomicrons uh, through systemic circulation. Um, again, same kind of thing, inadequately digested lipids can be uh, metabolized by gut flora. Um, typically, you know, we're going to see lipid problems um, not because of lipase deficiency, although that can be an issue, um, but because of some sort of bile stasis and lack of bile salts. So that might lead to stools that are very yellow in color because there's no bile. And remember, bile has that pigment bilirubin, which is going to give the stool its color. Um, so without the bile, you'll have light color stools. They'll tend to float because of the high fat content. And that's, of course, that condition called steatorrhea. Um, so that could be a problem of malabsorption. Um, in terms of vitamins, most are absorbed in the small intestine, remember, and we divide them into lipid soluble, and they're going to require, again, bile acids for their absorption, and the B vitamin A, D, the E complex, and the K vitamins, uh, and then the water soluble vitamins, which would include uh, vitamin C and the B complex, and remember that B12 specifically needs intrinsic factor, uh, oh, not IR, IF, intrinsic factor, uh, from the uh, stomach and the, from the parietal cells. So that's going to be important for its absorption in the distal ileum. Uh, and then most minerals are absorbed in the small intestine as well. Uh, minerals and metals all have, the majority of them, especially metals, have uh, carrier proteins. So for example, with iron, there's a protein called transferrin, which is going to help take up the iron and then transport it through the blood to where it needs to go. Uh, and then within tissues, it can be stored complex to a protein called ferritin. So that's an iron storage protein. Copper has its own carrier protein called ceruloplasmin. And remember, with liver disorders, we can have an accumulation of iron or copper in some of those uh, genetic storage diseases. And uh, so we'd see accumulation of those different proteins.
Uh, water, um, primarily if you look at the large intestine, uh, pretty much the only thing that's really absorbed would be water and then some of the vitamins and um, uh, produced by gut bacteria and some of the minerals like potassium and so forth would be reabsorbed in the large intestine. Uh, but mostly our nutrients are absorbed in the small intestine. So that's the summary of how all our foodstuffs are absorbed and where they're absorbed and so forth. So we're going to focus now on metabolism at the cellular level. We've looked at it kind of from the organ perspective, but so let's see what happens to all these foodstuffs at the cell level. Um, so metabolism, by definition, is the aggregate of all chemical reactions that take place in the body. Um, and the metabolism at the cell level is driven by enzymes. Um, so our enzymes really are the drivers of the life processes. And uh, when people used to talk about vital forces and whatnot, uh, in living organisms, that concept became replaced essentially with enzymology, where we realized that all the life activities in living organisms are driven by these enzyme systems. Um, now, what makes the enzymes work and how they interact with water and the biophysical properties, that's a very interesting area that, again, begins to um, bring us into maybe fields related to bioelectricity and so forth. But um, in terms of the actual driving factors is the enzymes. And remember many enzymes, as we'll see, actually have a uh, either a cofactor, which would be a metal like iron or copper, um, and the iron and copper or the other metal can become oxidized or reduced. So we'll have to be very clear about what we mean by that. Remember oxidation reactions uh, basically are reactions that uh, where the compound is going to lose an electron. Um, so Basically, the electron is lost uh, in oxidation versus a reduction reaction is a reaction in which the compound is actually going to gain an electron. Um, so oxidation reaction, reduction reactions are really how electrons are shuttled around the body. As we'll see in metabolism, we, uh, what happens in mitochondria and whatnot is all about oxidation and reduction. And that's basically shuttling around electrons. Electrons have energy, so they are the energy units. So when we talk about chi and these kinds of concepts in traditional medicines, we can make a parallel with the transfer of electrons and that electron energy. Um, the overall process of cellular metabolism we can liken to a controlled combustion. So instead of burning everything quickly and releasing this heat, uh, products like glucose are essentially broken down into smaller molecules and as they're catabolized, the uh, electrons are stripped out and are connected, are taken up by electron carriers and delivered to other molecules. So essentially, uh, we can think of that as controlled oxidation, controlled combustion. Um, nutrition refers to the acquisition, assimilation, and use of nutrients that are contained in food. Um, and all of this is linked via the anabolic and catabolic processes. So of course we ingest our food and the food is then broken down or generally oxidized um, resulting in what are called exergonic reactions. Remember exergonic means the release of heat or energy um, and that could be heat itself or it could be in the form of electrons. Uh, so here you see for example food molecules like sugars, lipids, proteins. Uh, they have a lot of energy in them. Uh, as they are catabolized through so the process of catabolism uh, they're going to donate, give up essentially their electrons, and that is going to charge up ener energy carriers like ADP, and that's going to become ATP. Or we'll see another very important electron carrier is NAD. Uh, NAD will become um, uh, reduced to essentially NADH. NADH. Um, they're also showing in this picture NADP, which is another molecule, uh, another electron carrier. But NAD, um, NA, usually it's written NAD+, plus, is the oxidized form of NAD. When it gains an electron, it's going to become NADH. And that essentially is the reduced form. And then NADH can donate its electron to another reaction and become NAD plus again. So that's an example of an electron carrier. So that's um, one type of oxidation reduction reaction that can happen. And the process, again, energy is released, so this is exergonic, and so the food molecule becomes uh, oxidized essentially to carbon dioxide. Uh, we'll see water as well as a product, as well as different waste products. Um, so that's the catabolic side. On the anabolic side, those uh, 
uh, reduced energy carriers, the NAD, ATP, and so forth, now can donate their energy, their electrons, to simple precursor molecules um, via endergonic reactions. In other words, these require the input of energy uh, to give us all of our different cell components. So our proteins and, and uh, um, storage carbohydrates and lipids and so forth. So we can build up molecules that way. So this is a kind of, this diagram kind of represents the general energy metabolism uh, in the body. Um, uh, remember that the glucose, uh, all the monosaccharides and amino acids and the short chain fatty acids uh, all essentially enter the liver uh, and then are going to get to the body cells and that's where these processes of metabolism begin. So again, just quickly to review, catabolism is the breakdown of the larger molecules into smaller molecules. Energy is released as exergonic and that can be used to drive other processes and this process is known as cellular respiration. So we'll look at how that happens in detail in the coming slides. Um, catabolism essentially occurs through a series of either oxidations, uh, remember that's a loss of electrons, uh, dehydrogenations, that's pulling off a hydrogen ion, that's usually a, what's called a hydride ion, which is a um, hydrogen with uh, an electron. So it's with an extra electron, so it becomes negatively charged. Um, so that's another type of electron carrier or hydrolysis, which is the addition of water. So that's catabolic reactions. Um, anabolism is going to be the synthesis of larger molecules from smaller molecules. These processes occur through reduction and dehydration or removal of water reactions. Um, it's occurring via reduction or redox reactions where the uh, we have to input electrons into that reaction. Uh, again, sometimes from hydrogen atoms like the hydride ion or the electron carriers as we'll see here. Uh, and then energy is required to drive that reaction so it's endergonic. Um, I mentioned we've talked about ATP before. This is a major electron carrier. So uh, we have the ADP which is basically two uh, high energy phosphate groups attached to the rest of this molecule here. Um, via uh, uh, the uh, reduction reactions, we can add energy in, and that essentially uh, allows us to attach another phosphate group to this molecule. And these bonds between the phosphate groups contain very high energy. They're called high energy uh, phosphol, uh, phosphol anhydride bonds. And when they're broken, they can then release that energy and that can be used to fuel, uh, to basically give electrons and energy to other cellular reactions. And then we go from ATP back to ADP again. So this process is undergoing constant recycling. And as we'll see, one of the major organelles in the cells where we make ATP, uh, charged up ATP, is the mitochondria. So the mitochondria, think of them as ATP machines that are essentially pumping out ATP to drive your other cellular reactions. Another two very important electron carriers, I just mentioned one previously, that is NAD, nicotinamide uh, adenine dinucleotide. This is derived from vitamin B3. So this is where we see B vitamins play an essential role in energy metabolism. That's one of their main uh, functions. So here's vitamin B3. Um, and uh, vitamin B3, essentially the NAD again, can become a reduced to become NADH. So NADH is the reduced form. NADH can be oxidized to become NAD again. And um, when that reaction happens, we get an, also a hydrogen ion and two electrons out of that. So these electrons can then be used for other reactions. Um, so that's an electron carrier. So electrons never just float around in the body fluids by themselves. They have to be actually shuttled by these different molecules like ATP in those high energy phosphate bonds, or in this case, NAD. The third electron carrier we need to know about is FAD, flavine adenine dinucleotide. This is derived from riboflavin or vitamin B2. Um, and this is another uh, coenzyme. This essentially can be reduced to become uh, FADH2. So FADH2 um, is the reduced form of FAD. And, um, and that's shown in this uh, picture down here. So essentially it can store up electrons as well. So we'll see both NAD, FAD are uh, important electron carriers, which can then donate the, electron, the electrons to other reactions.
Now there's two major metabolic processes we need to kind of compare and contrast. I've been talking um, so far about cellular respiration, and this happens really through these processes of catabolism and oxidation reactions. Um, so essentially taking our foodstuffs like glucose, oxidizing it to essentially become carbon dioxide and water, as well as uh, uh, electrons that can be then captured by those electron carriers. And this occurs primarily in mitochondria. Um, and uh, we'll see that glucose, as well as fatty acids and uh, certain amino acids called ketogenic amino acids, can all, uh, all result essentially in the central molecule of metabolism we'll look at in the next slide called acetyl-CoA. Acetyl-CoA is kind of the central molecule. It's basically vinegar with a what's called CoA molecule attached to it. Um, so it's to two carbons, um, acetic acid, attached to this other larger molecule as a sort of a carrier molecule. Uh, the acetyl-CoA is going to be the central molecule that's going to enter into the mitochondria, go through the so-called Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain, which we'll talk about here in coming slides, and that will result in ATP. So uh, keep acetyl-CoA in mind because we're gonna be coming back to that a lot. This process in animals and humans um, of cellular respiration requires oxygen. Now glucose, we'll see, can actually uh, undergo metabolism. We can get a little ATP out of that um, and it can become lactic acid or lactate. And that can happen anaerobically. But to really get the full utilization of glucose and our other foodstuffs, we need oxygen and that is known as aerobic metabolism. And uh, this happens inside of mitochondria. So mitochondria need oxygen to uh, essentially oxidize these foodstuffs and to create ATP out of that. Um, generally, carbon dioxide is gonna be the byproduct. Um, so again, carbohydrates, proteins, fats, uh, when they're digested and absorbed, we get our simple sugars like glucose, our amino acids, and our fatty acids. Uh, those can be further catabolized into acetyl-CoA. The acetyl-CoA can enter into inside the mitochondria uh, into the uh, citric acid cycle, uh, the, the so-called Krebs cycle, and uh, that's going to result in a little bit of ATP, but uh, lots of the NAD, FAD being charged up carrying electrons, that will then enter into what's called the electron transport chain, which happens also inside of mitochondria, and that will give us our full complement of ATP. Um, so again, this process occurs aerobically. It requires oxygen. So this is known as aerobic metabolism. Um, so it occurs in mitochondria. It involves the Krebs cycle, uh, or again, another name for that is called the TCA, tricyclic uh, acid cycle. Um, and uh, it uses acetyl-CoA as a starting material. We can make energy in cells aerob anaerobically, doesn't require oxygen, via glycolysis, which is the breakdown of glucose into a molecule called pyruvate, um, and that occurs in the cytoplasm of cells. Um, but that results in only a couple of ATP molecules, whereas we'll see with aerobic metabolism, we get upward of 35 or more ATP molecules uh, per molecule. Um, Per molecule of glucose. So a lot more energy is produced out of that aerobically than anaerobically. Um, animals and humans use an, uh, anabolic metabolism as well. So we do use, make synthesize things like proteins and lipids and glycogen um, and so forth. And this occurs primarily in the liver. So we can think of liver as our inner anabolic uh, sort of organ. And uh, as we'll see, this is very similar to what is happening in plants. So that's why some refer to the liver, the life giver, as our inner plant organ. So that's cellular respiration. Plants, of course, do the opposite. They are able to do photosynthesis, and some uh, other organisms can photosynthesize as well. And this is really centered around anabolism and reduction reactions. And the specialized organelle within plants uh, is the chloroplast. So any organism that has a chloroplast can photosynthesize. Uh, we think chloroplast and mitochondria actually came from primitive bacteria that uh, sort of formed a symbiotic relationship with eukaryotic cells. And uh, that's where we, that's why we see a lot of similarities actually between chloroplast and mitochondria. Remember both, chloro, both mitochondria and chloroplasts, I don't think I've talked about chloroplasts before, but mitochondria, both of them have their own DNA.
Now, the DNA, of course, is needed to provide the blueprints for all the proteins, for the enzymes that are needed within these organelles. Uh, turns out that with, with mitochondria, only about 13% of the DNA that's totally needed to make all those proteins is present. Most of the DNA is still in the nucleus of the cell. So the cell nucleus has to make all these proteins, which then shuttle out to the mitochondria. Uh, but chloroplasts and mitochondria have their own little DNA, and it's in the form of what's called circular DNA, or plasmid, which is very similar to what we see in bacteria. So that gives credence to the idea that these were uh, primitive bacteria that actually migrated into cells and now have formed a symbiotic relationship. But what happens in the chloroplast essentially is a reduction reaction, where we take, uh, where carbon dioxide from the atmosphere is taken in, and through the action of sunlight, the sun is actually going to use to split water and inside the chloroplast and that water splitting releases electrons and those electron energies now uh, are combined with carbon dioxide uh, through reduction and the carbon dioxide is essentially fixed into glucose and all the other metabolites that I'll talk about here in just a second. Uh, and the byproduct of this is oxygen. So it's a beautiful symbiotic relationship where in cellular respiration, we produce carbon dioxide and some water, um, whereas in chloroplasts, that carbon dioxide is now fixed into molecules like glucose, um, which then could be metabolized in cellular respiration back to carbon dioxide. Uh, and another byproduct of chloroplast is oxygen. Um, and we need oxygen in the mitochondria as well. So this is a beautiful balanced relationship between photosynthesis and cellular respiration. Ultimately, we can say that in the chloroplast, light energy is being fixed into the substances like glucose. Um, oxygen is a byproduct. And then in the cellular respiration and mitochondria, we're essentially catabolizing the glucose, the foodstuffs, and releasing chemical energy. So the energy that drives our body uh, is essentially light energy from the sun. So we can say we are, uh, you know, we've internalized that light energy into these molecules and the process of metabolism is essentially releasing that light energy. So I've spoken before about this interesting concept of the inner light body and uh, this kind of is one of the foundations of that. Again, that light energy is what traditional medicines have often referred to as chi. So the chi energy itself comes from this, these kinds of reactions. Now, chi has additional factors which uh, modern science doesn't recognize yet, and that would be that it has the capacity to organize cells. And I think that's something that's not discussed very much even in traditional medicines, the power of chi as a formative or organizing force, not just a life-giving force. Um, so that's something that we're not seeing. We don't see the organization from this, but there are other factors that go into that. But essentially we can think of the, uh, again, all the chemical ATP energy and everything else uh, in our body is coming from sunlight, ultimately. Um, so that's the process of photosynthesis. Now plants produce uh, what I call primary metabolites, uh, and that would be carbohydrates. So uh, glucose is a big one, but usually plants store those up in the form of starches, polysaccharides. So amylose, amylopectin, and so forth is what we consume from our, uh, especially root vegetables and so forth. Um, amino acids, plants can make amino acids and proteins. Um, so they can synthesize, they can convert the sugars made via uh, photosynthesis into amino acids. So there are chemical pathways in the plants for that. Uh, they, plants can make lipids and fatty acids. So the oils that we see in the seeds and whatnot are synthesized in the plant. And they also make DNA, RNA. Uh, these are called primary metabolites because pretty much all plants uh, across all the different uh, uh, species and genera and whatnot make these metabolites. So they're not specific to individual plant families or so forth. Now, specific plant families can focus, uh, they have specific enzyme systems, and they can manufacture various secondary metabolites. And that would include things like terpenes and terpenoids, phenols and polyphenols, alkaloids, uh, glucosinolates, uh, cyanogenic compounds, etc. These secondary metabolites are what we use in plant medicine primarily as our different plant constituents. So our medicinal plants usually have all these enzyme systems to make these different types of molecules. Uh, and then they have medicinal effects. So that's the difference between primary and secondary metabolites. Secondary can be isolated more to specific plant families 
or groupings of plants that have those enzyme systems. Um, as an aside, that's an interesting way to study herbal medicine. We usually classify herbs based on we are kind of observed physiologic or pharmacologic properties. So clear heat, uh, clear phlegm, you know, uh, tonify chi, those kinds of herbs in traditional medicines. Um, but if you kind of just memorize herbs that way, it can become very confusing. But if you start to actually learn plant families, so plant families are really uh, groupings of plants based on morphological shape characteristics, as well as similarities in chemistry and genetics. Um, so we have, for example, the mint family or the carrot family or the rose family. And we have many members of these families. Interestingly, we use many of them medicinally, uh, like in the mints, you know, there's probably a good two dozen different mints that we use uh, commonly in uh, herbal medicine or culinary medicine. Um, and uh, they all interestingly share similar chemistry. So although we might classify them in our books differently, they actually all have a similar relationship. So all the mints, for example, are very rich in very unique compounds, uh, different terpenes, for example, and that gives them all sorts of very interesting similar properties. Um, so if we look at rosemary, we look at lycopis, leonoris, all these herbs, a lot of them we find actually classified as cardiac herbs or blood moving herbs or herbs that have some affinity for the cardiovascular system. Um, so that's another way we can learn herbs and I haven't seen many people do that in Chinese medicine where they've grouped together the plant families and uh, looked at the similarities in the underlying chemistry and so forth. Um, so that's primary and secondary metabolites produced by plants. Now just a final aside here, plants actually can also use catabolic metabolism. Plants do have mitochondria. Um, it's just that the leaves primarily have chloroplasts. Um, but the blossoms in plants, what happens there is that the chloroplasts actually uh, fade away and primarily the blossoms have mitochondria. So the blossoms really are modified leaves, the petals of your flowers are modified leaves that have lost their chloroplasts. They gain pigment molecules, which gives them their color, um, but they're also very rich in mitochondria. So they're actually undergoing cellular respiration. They metabolize energy just like animals. We can say the blossom is animal-like in that way. And uh, some plants actually, uh, one, one of the things we'll see is a byproduct of cellular respiration, in addition to ATP, is also heat. So uh, we make heat uh, via the process where, you know, ATP usually is made via electron transfer. We'll look at those details here in a second. Um, but you can actually uh, uncouple that process and that results in heat. Well, the same thing can happen in blossoms and some plants like skunk cabbage actually generate heat in their flowers um, and that is able to melt. The flower head can actually melt its way through the snow, for example, in the, in the early spring uh, to get above the snow line. So um, that's, uh, that's the, the fact that cellular respiration can happen in plants as well. Um, okay, so that's the differences there in the polarity between photosynthesis and cellular respiration uh, are two major anabolic and catabolic metabolic processes in nature. Okay, let's talk next about the citric acid cycle. So here we're going to jump into a bit more biochemistry and I'm going to try to just summarize the overall picture. We don't need to get bogged down in all the details, which can be extensive if we go through that. So let's try to get the, keep the overall picture in mind here. So the citric acid cycle is also known as the Krebs cycle, the tricarboxylic acid cycle, TCA cycle, um, citric acid cycle. So it goes by many different names. So you're gonna see it written in different textbooks, but they're all referring to the same thing. And what it is essentially is a series of chemical reactions that occurs inside of mitochondria. Now, mitochondria, remember, have two different compartments. There is an outer membrane on the mitochondria, um, and then there's an inner membrane, which is folded into these folds called cristae. So the cristae are the folds of the inner membrane. And then between the outer and the inner membrane, there's a space called the, the, uh, the uh, intermembrane space. So we have a space between the two. And this space is gonna be very important because essentially what's gonna happen in the catabolism of glucose and other foodstuffs, uh, as it goes through the citric acid cycle and then the next phase called the electron transport chain, which also occurs inside the, uh, um, the, inside the mitochondria, this inner space inside is called the matrix. So it occurs inside the matrix of the mitochondria. Um, 
as that process occurs, it's going to result in hydrogen ions building up in this intermembrane space. And that's going to form an electrochemical gradient uh, where basically the intermembrane space will become positively charged and then this uh, matrix space becomes negatively charged. And that forms essentially a battery effect and there's a special enzyme present in the intermembrane uh, called ATP synthase. And ATP synthase is going to take these hydrogen ions from the intramembrane space are going to funnel through the ATP synthase back to the matrix following the electrochemical gradient. And in the process, the energy that's captured is going to be used to make ATP. So you could say the overall effect of metabolism is going to be to take our foodstuffs like glucose uh, and so forth, uh, and it's going to be to oxidize all of that yeah, essentially into water and carbon dioxide. But in the process, the energy that's captured from that is going to be used to make ATP via this electrochemical gradient. So I know that might sound complicated, but let's see if we can figure out what I just said as we go here. Um, so um, looking at this diagram, we see this molecule pyruvate, which we haven't talked about yet. But pyruvate is essentially the breakdown product of glucose. So glucose will go through a series of reactions that we'll look at in the next video called glycolysis. Glycolysis is the oxidation of glucose into pyruvate. In fact, one molecule of glucose forms two pyruvates. Um, so that can get a little confusing because everything's gonna be doubled as we go down here. But basically, glucose is gonna be converted into pyruvate and the pyruvate can actually enter into the mitochondria. I should mention that certain amino acids can also make pyruvate. Um, I won't go into which ones here just yet, uh, but they can also make pyruvate. But the pyruvate can enter into the mitochondria. They can go through both linings, the outer membrane and the inner membrane, and it goes into the matrix of the mitochondria. And there, there are enzymes that convert pyruvate into acetyl-CoA. And remember that acetyl-CoA is our central molecule of metabolism. Now, fatty acids can also contribute to acetyl-CoA. So really our three primary foodstuffs, our glucose, our amino acids, and our fatty acids all end up as acetyl-CoA. The acetyl-CoA then can also, will then enter into what's called the citric acid cycle. And this is a series of chemical reactions essentially that are going to oxidize acetyl-CoA into carbon dioxide, um, CO2, plus energy in the form of reduced NAD, and FAD. So essentially we're going to get electrons charging up those electron carriers. The electron carriers will then carry those electrons to enzymes that are embedded on the wall of the matrix here, the inner membrane space, and that's part of what's called the electron transport chain. So I'll show you that later. Um, and that's going to result in the ATP. So this is the uh, first part of that, the citric acid cycle. This process does require oxygen. Now the citric acid cycle directly doesn't need oxygen, but unfortunately if the next part, the electron transport chain, doesn't get oxygen, we get a buildup of NADH and FADH2. And when those build up, those will inhibit the citric acid cycle. So it won't be able to go forward and uh, so everything gets stopped. So we do need oxygen uh, ultimately to allow the citric acid cycle to go forward. Um, there are basically 10 enzymatically driven steps and uh, all of these enzymes that are needed for the citric acid cycle, although it's drawn here in the middle of the matrix, the enzymes are actually embedded on the inner wall of the matrix. Um, so embedded on the inner mitochondrial membrane. And um, so these constituents kind of will go between one and the other. Um, in order to summarize the steps here, let's just go through kind of the basic steps. So step one essentially is gonna be the creation of the acetyl-CoA, which I just talked about. And so let me just say a little more about acetyl-CoA here. Um, acetyl-CoA can be made from pyruvate. Again, that comes from glucose via glycolysis or from ketogenic amino acids. Um, again, fatty acids can directly give acetyl-CoA. Uh, but acetyl-CoA is gonna be the, main, the first molecule we need to start the citric acid cycle. And the reaction in, the, in converting pyruvate to acetyl-CoA uh, is via pyruvate dehydrogenase. Uh, 
and the the net effect is to make from pyruvate acetyl-CoA plus carbon dioxide. So this is where one molecule of carbon dioxide comes off in the reaction. That's going to be our first place where CO2 is given off. Um, this enzyme needs various cofactors, and here is where vitamin B1 comes in. Vitamin B1 is called thiamine. So thiamine pyrophosphate, or TPP, is the activated form of vitamin B1. Um, this this uh, enzyme complex called pyruvate dehydrogenase is actually a very big complex. There's five different enzymes that are actually in this complex, and I don't want to, we don't need to delve into all those details. But another aspect of that complex um, is uh, lipoic acid. So lipoic acid will be um, uh, another cofactor, and you might see that as a dietary supplement. So we can think of py uh, lipoic acid as needed as an antioxidant in the body, that's one of its roles. But another very important role is as a cofactor in the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex that's going to convert pyruvate, the end product from carbohydrates, into acetyl-CoA. So we can say lipoic acid is needed for proper carbohydrate metabolism. Uh, this process also requires insulin. So insulin acts as a signaling molecule that can uh, speed this along. Here is acetyl-CoA. Acetyl-CoA essentially is an acetyl group right here, which is a carbon with a double bonded oxygen and then a methyl group, CH3. So it's really a two carbon group. Um, and that is attached to pantothenic acid, which is actually vitamin B5. So here's vitamin B5. Um, and then that is attached to this big molecule right here, this phosphorylated molecule, uh, which is basically a phosphorylated ADP. Um, so basically, this is what we call uh, acetyl-CoA. Uh, this part, which has the pantothenic acid and the uh, ADP, is called coenzyme A. So acetyl-CoA, CoA means coenzyme A. Acetyl-CoA is when we have an acetyl group attached to it. So it's a huge molecule, but basically the sort of functional part here is the acetyl group, this two-carbon group. And that, again, comes from the catabolism of pyruvate, um, which came from the catabolism of glucose or the amino acids. Um, okay, so that's uh, first step is forming acetyl-CoA. Um, the next two steps, steps two through 10, we can spend a whole lecture on, and I don't want to kind of belabor it, but I want to just kind of summarize what happened. So let me blow up this diagram here. So this is the citric acid cycle. Each one of these um, little blocks is a different compound in the citric acid cycle. And then each of these is an enzyme. So here we have aconitase. Uh, we'll start here with citrate synthesase. So here is acetyl-CoA uh, we just talked about. Uh, the very first step of the, of the citric acid cycle is for acetyl-CoA to combine with a molecule called oxaloacetate. So oxaloacetate is found there inside the mitochondria. It combines with acetyl-CoA, and there's an enzyme that actually brings that together called citrate synthase. So that's the first step here. And that forms citrate. Uh, and they're showing in this picture the actual kind of uh, ball and stick diagrams of what these carbons look like. But we can kind of use this to kind of keep track of the carbon. So citrate has, uh, so if we look at pyruvate, it's three carbons. Acetyl-CoA is two carbons. Um, and then when we combine it with oxaloacetate to form citrate, we now have one, two, three, four, five, six carbons. So we're starting with a six carbon compound in the citric acid cycle. Okay, so that's the first step. Now, interesting thing about synthase is, is they don't need a lot of energy or any energy really input to cause this reaction to go forward. So this is not an energy dependent step. So we make citrate, then an enzyme called aconitase, which is again found inside the mitochondria, converts citrate to cis-aconitate, uh, and then um, basically it uh, is going to go through another reaction to form D-isocitrate. Uh, and D-isocitrate at this point, so here's uh, cis-aconitase, one, two, three, four, five, six carbons. Uh, D-isocitrate is still six carbons. It just rearranges the carbon chain here a little bit. But we're finding the next step, D-isocitrate to alpha-ketoglutarate, is catalyzed by isocitrate dehydrogenase. This is actually the rate-limiting enzyme in the Krebs cycle. And isocitrate dehydrogenase makes alpha-ketoglutarate. 
Um, it also, this step will charge up an NAD to form a reduced NADH, as well as it strips off a carbon to form carbon dioxide. So alpha ketoglutarate is five carbons long. So we've gotten down now to a five carbon long uh, compound. And uh, the next step is catalyzed by an enzyme called alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase. We form another uh, charged up NAD, NADH, and we form another molecule of carbon dioxide. So essentially our two carbon acetyl group has now been completely stripped off as carbon dioxide. But in the process, we've made two charged energy carriers, two NADHs. These are accumulating inside the matrix of the mitochondria. We're gonna see they're gonna be necessary for the next phase, uh, which is the electron transport chain. Um, then alpha ketoglutarate is gonna become succinyl-CoA, and then there's another reaction which actually charges up a molecule called GDP into GTP. And GTP can actually be used to convert ADP into ATP. So the citric acid cycle is actually able to make one molecule of ATP each time it goes around. Uh, remember that glucose yields two molecules of pyruvate. Uh, two molecules of acetyl-CoA. So for every molecule of glucose, we essentially can go around the cycle twice. Um, anyways, so we make, in this case, an ATP molecule. Then we get through the action of succinyl-CoA synthase, succinate, um, and don't, uh, let's not talk about this here just yet. Uh, succinate will become fumarate, which at this point, these are all four carbon uh, molecules. Uh, water is added, we get malate, and then we get one final step where we charge up an NAD to an NADH, uh, and we end up with oxaloacetate, uh, which is again a four carbon sugar. It combines with acetyl-CoA to form citrate, and the cycle goes around and around and around. So this is why we call this not a chemical reaction, but really a cycle, because it's as long as we have acetyl-CoA, and uh, we don't have too much NAD H accumulating, this cycle will keep going around. Now, one important thing I'll just mention is NADH accumulates. Let's say we get a lot of it accumulating. Um, it will inhibit this rate limiting enzyme, isocitrate dehydrogenase. And that's why we need the NAD to be used up and it's gonna be used up in the electron transport chain. Um, so we'll look at that in the next step here. Um, so that's, that's what's happening essentially in the overall reaction cycle here. Um, interestingly, when you consume alcohol, when alcohol is catabolized, it makes uh, acetyl-CoA, but you also get a lot of NADH accumulating oops, um, when you catabolize alcohol. And so what ends up happening is alcohol actually shuts off the citric acid cycle, and all that acetyl-CoA is going to be used to make fatty acids. Interesting. So with alcohol, we're going to actually get more fat production less energy production uh, from your mitochondria. Um, okay, so that's the citric acid cycle, again, occurring inside mitochondria, the first step here in cellular respiration. So the end products of the Krebs cycle are going to be three NADH. Um, so in this way, for each molecule of, uh, of uh, acetyl-CoA going into the pathway, and again, a single molecule of glucose will give two acetyl-CoA, so we'd have to double these numbers per molecule of glucose, if we're looking at glucose as an energy substrate. But for every molecule of acetyl-CoA going into the cycle, we get three NADH plus three hydrogen ions plus two FADH2. So we get these charged electron carriers. We get two carbon dioxide molecules coming out. And remember that uh, we had another carbon dioxide produced up there in the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. So uh, if we talk about glucose via pyruvate, we actually get three carbon dioxides. Um, and again, per molecule of, of glucose, we'd have to double that, we'd get six. Um, and then we get one ATP via GTP. So this is the end products of the Krebs cycle. So we're not done yet with energy metabolism, but this is, has charged up those electron carriers. Okay, so hopefully you're still with me after looking at the Krebs cycle. Let's look at the final phase of cellular respiration. Uh, and this is known as oxidative phosphorylation and it involves something called the electron transport chain. Now what's the electron transport chain? It's a series of enzymes found in the inner membrane of the mitochondria. So remember mitochondria have the outer membrane, inner membrane, intermembrane space, and then the matrix. Uh, the 
the citric acid or TCA Krebs cycle that we just looked at is found inside the matrix. It's found, it's kind of not drawn correctly here. Again, the enzymes that catalyze each step of the citric acid cycle are found embedded in the membrane here. Um, but to make it clear, they've just drawn it as a little circle in the middle. So I'm not going to go through that. But basically remember that the, the citric acid cycle results in a lot of reduced NAD and FAD. Uh, so basically, we're, we've stripped electrons off of the acetyl-CoA, we've catabolized it into carbon dioxide, the electrons are captured, and they're going to be delivered to a series of enzymes, complexes, that are embedded in the inner membrane of the mitochondria. Um, so we, let's look at this one here. So we have NADH, it's going to be transferred to this complex called complex 1, and it's going to be reduced in the uh, oxidized in the process. So NADH will become NAD plus plus a hydrogen ion. But the electron that was there is going to be shuttled through a series of reactions. And these reactions are not shown in this picture, but they involve iron sulfur complexes. So iron is going to be go through a series of reductions and oxidations. Um, it's going to go from a plus three state to a plus two state, back to plus three. And the electron will be shuttled through a series of um, of molecules in this complex and the net results will be two things one is you see this little molecule called Q uh, that's the symbol for a molecule called ubiquinone I'll write it out here ubiquinone uh, or same thing as coenzyme Q10 you probably heard that also as a supplement coenzyme Q10 Coenzyme Q10 is synthesized in the body, so we don't need it technically as a supplement, but some argue if you add more, it, it speeds up this process. But basically, co, the CoQ10 can exist in an oxidized or reduced form. Um, so what happens with complex one is that electron that was shuttled through it is going to reduce CoQ10. So we actually get reduced CoQ10 um, here at, after this first step. And this complex is called complex 1. That's why it has the Roman numeral 1. So that's the first thing. We're going to reduce ubiquinone or CoQ10 from an oxidized to reduced form. And CoQ10 is interesting. It's a small molecule. It can actually freely shuttle through the intermembrane space. And it's going to move that electron from complex 1 to complex 3. Um, so let's talk about that in a second. But the second thing that happens in complex 1 is as this process is happening, hydrogen ions are pumped out into the intermembrane space between the two, the outer and the inner membrane. So we're going to start pumping hydrogen ions from the matrix out into that space. And remember, these lipid barriers are not very permeable to hydrogen, so it's going to act, basically it's going to start accumulating in that space here. Okay, so that's complex one. CoQ10 has been reduced. It carries the electron to complex three. Complex three also is a series of iron sulfur complexes and so forth. Um, and the electron is going to be transferred to a second electron carrier called cytochrome C. And hydrogen ions will also be pumped out in that process. Cytochrome C delivers the electrons then to complex four. And in complex four, we get the final step where we get hydrogen ions pumped out again. But here, the oxygen that we have been talking about that's brought in from your hemoglobin, goes into, diffuses through the tissues, gets into the mitochondria. The oxygen is going to capture that electron and it's going to combine with a proton and it becomes water. So essentially, that electron uh, now has become water. And so this is the end stage here. So what we get is water. We've used up the oxygen, but we get all these hydrogens that have been pumped out into this intermembrane space. Now it's called the electron transport chain because basically the electrons are just shuttled from one complex to another. Now not shown in this picture is electrons have energy. So let's say this picture is the energy of an electron. The electron coming in down here with the original NAD is very high energy. It's a lot of energy. As it goes through each of these steps, as hydrogen is pumped out and it's transferred, and it ends up in the end as water, that electron is going to subsequently lose energy 
So by the time we get water down here, the electron has lost most of its energy. So that's kind of where we're essentially taking the energy from that electron and using it to drive all these different processes. Pretty amazing that uh, you know the body can couple, uh, biological systems can couple this energy and use it to drive these different processes. So uh, that's the end result there. Water um, and the hydrogen ions in the intramembrane space. Now let me backtrack a little bit. Uh, one of the steps, remember, the citric acid cycle is the production of succinate. And the succinate, um, there's an enzyme that converts succinate to fumarate, and that's found in complex number two. And what happens there is that that step can also take electrons out, and that can transfer it to CoQ10. And then that can go into complex three and complex four like we just talked about. So that's a second way that electrons are entering into the electron transport chain via succinate. That's a little minor detail, uh, but just know the overall process. We've taken electrons from the citric acid cycle, now transfer them to the complexes of the electron transport chain. They're shuttled down. Um, as they're shuttled down, hydrogen is being pumped out into the endure membrane space. And that's essentially forming an electrochemical gradient. So what we're going to find is what we see in this picture. The inner space, the matrix of the mitochondria, has low hydrogen ion concentration after this occurs. And it's going to become negatively charged relative to the uh, intermembrane space, which is going to be positively charged with all those hydrogen ions. So essentially, we formed a battery. We have you know, a plus and a minus charge across an insulated membrane. That forms more like a capacitor, actually, if you remember that concept from physics. Uh, so we have like two charged plates across with an insulator between them. So it's storing energy. Now, we need one more step in order to make ATP. And that involves this very important hormone uh, enzyme sorry, called ATP synthase. ATP synthase is found inside the intermembrane. It actually consists of two different protein complexes. Uh, one is called F0, and that complex allows hydrogen ions to, to fall through an ion channel back to the matrix. So they're just going to follow the electrochemical gradient. They're going to go to where it's more negative. They're going to fall through the ATP synthase channel, the F0 channel. In the process, another part of the protein called the F1 portion will capture the energy from that hydrogen ion and we'll use that to reduce uh, ATP into a, uh, ADP, sorry, into ATP. So essentially, that energy will be used to attach another phosphate group to AT, ADP to make ATP. And that's where we form our ATP. So that is a long, complex process, but that's how we make ATP inside the mitochondria. Um, and this... Uh, process, this is called the chemiosmotic process in terms of how the ATP synthase captures it. Um, that kind of describes you know, how we capture that energy there. Um, one thing I will say about those complexes, finally, the complex one and three and four and so forth, these are known as cytochromes. Uh, and that's because when chemists first started looking at them, they found they, they created these really beautiful colored solutions. Um, but they contain iron and copper. So iron and copper are very important, what we call respiratory metals, because they help fuel the electron transport chain. Another interesting feature is that we know that um, cytochrome C, this one right here, this electron carrier, um, its activity is accelerated if it's exposed to red light. And interestingly, we're seeing a lot of people using LED LED red light and laser red light. Um, on the skin. And what happens there is that the LED, the red light, can actually penetrate a couple of centimeters down, actually. It can get pretty deep into the tissue. All the mitochondria in the pathway of that light can absorb the light, and the cytochrome C especially can absorb it. It's tuned exactly to the frequency of the red light, and that causes the molecule to vibrate faster, and it helps actually propel the electrons through it more quickly. So we can think of red light as accelerating the electron transport chain. Interestingly, blue light does exactly the opposite. It slows down the electron transport chain. You make less ATP. Um, so very interesting process where red light can be used to accelerate. So if we look at tissues like muscle, we need a lot of ATP and muscle to help muscle relax. Once the muscle fibers have slid past each other, you need to combine them with ATP to get them to unhook and relax. And it turns out that uh, 
if we shine red light on those muscles, they'll make more ATP, they'll relax more. Uh, so that's why we're seeing a lot of these different therapies, and there's some good data now uh, looking at chronic muscle, musculoskeletal problems and whatnot using red light therapy um, as a, a treatment for that. Um, blue light might be used when you have too much ATP production. That can happen when there's inflammation or what we call heat in the body. Um, we might want to cool that down and um, so that would be using the blue light therapy. So we're seeing blue light used for acne and whatnot. Now research is actually looking at green light as a possibility for migraine headaches, uh, kind of a balance between the two. Um, okay, so the net effect of aerobic metabolism, again, this process required oxygen in the mitochondria, and that would be with the citric acid cycle in oxidative phosphorylation, is we're gonna get carbon dioxide water and energy in the form of ATP and some heat. Now I didn't talk about it, but there are various factors that can actually uh, uncouple the electron being transferred between these different complexes. And there's specific proteins actually called uncoupling proteins that can be inserted in the wall of the uh, inner membrane and they can capture those electrons. Um, so for example, brown fat has a lot of uncoupling protons, uh, proteins in the uh, mitochondria of the brown fat cells, and that's why brown fat makes a lot of heat. Um, so the uncoupling proteins actually take those electrons and they just dissipate them as heat. That energy is dissipated as heat instead of being captured as ATP. So there are various uncouplers. So uh, for instance, um, salicylates, uh, which is the product of you know uh, aspirin, amino salicylic acid, or salicylates in, in herbs. Um, we can get salicylate toxicity where you get too many of them. They actually act as uncoupling agents. They block the, they can cause the electrons to be shuttled off as heat so we can get fevers and whatnot. Interestingly, aconite, processed aconite, where we take the aconitine alkaloids out, which are quite toxic, um, but we have other terpenes in there, uh, other molecules. Those molecules have been shown to act as, to increase uncoupling protein. Uh, levels in different cells and essentially to shuttle off electrons as heat. So process aconite would generate body heat as a result of that, but it would also slow down ATP production, interestingly. Um, so we can say ultimately it has a process of turning down the energy and uh, generating more heat in the process. So that's the result of the uh, compounds in processed aconite. Um, one other thing I'll say is cyanide. One of the ways, the, the main way that cyanide works is it actually irreversibly binds to part of complex four. So cyanide actually uh, blocks the last step of the electron transport chain and uh, you can't actually complete it. The oxygen can't combine with that electron to make water. So we essentially stop the electron transport chain and make no ATP and, mu and tissues like uh, cardiac muscle and nervous system that make a lot of energy need uh, this mitochondria to be working adequately. And so cyanide actually poisoning will affect the heart and the nervous system first out of all the different tissues. So that's where cyanide comes in and cyanide poisoning. Now some herbs actually like uh, peach pit and whatnot actually contain low levels of cyanide and uh, or compounds that become cyanide when they're metabolized in the body. Uh, they're not enough to inhibit the mitochondria like cyanide poisoning would but at the very low level, some people suspect that they actually slow mitochondria down, and especially in so-called heat disorders, uh, lots of inflammation, you're making too much energy in those cases, um, actually that is able to slow everything down and uh, you know, have more of a cooling effect. So we can use very, very low doses of the cyanide compounds. A lot of them are in the Rose family um, and uh, uh, as uh, therapeutic agents. Okay, so Back to the net result of aerobic metabolism, we get carbon dioxide, water, energy uh, in the form of ATP and heat. Um, each molecule of glucose, if we look at a, start with glucose as our food stuff, if you go through all the cycles, go through um, glycolysis, which I'll review, I'll talk about in the next slide, look at the Krebs cycle, look at the oxidative phosphorylation, um, glucose can yield between 36 and 38 molecules of ATP. It differs because there's a little factor I didn't talk about, and that's that NAD actually needs a shuttle to get into the mitochondria. And um, there's two different shuttle systems and different cells have different ones. And so we'll get slightly different amounts of energy produced 
I won't go into those details. But basically, uh, each molecule of glucose will yield 36 to 38 molecules of ATP. Um, uh, two from the anaerobic metabolism that happens in the cytoplasm via glycolysis, and then 34 to 36 from the mitochondria. Um, so that's going to be our energy production, and that's a very large amount of energy per molecule of glucose. Again, the chemiosmotic hypothesis is describing the mechanism in which energy is released at points along the electron transport chain uh, via the driving of the hydrogen ions into the intermembrane space and then the action of ATP synthase. Um, the NAD and FAD, uh, when they're reduced, can produce between, so NAD, reduced NAD that we form in the Krebs cycle uh, can form 2.5 molecules of ATP and the reduced FAD forms 1.5 molecules of ATP. So those are just some numbers to put everything in the context here. So just understand the overall process here. Again, if we look at glucose and glycolysis forming pyruvic acid, that's going to go into the cell, become acetyl-CoA uh, into the mitochondria, and then that goes into the Krebs cycle, and then the electron transport chain, and the net result is going to be lots of ATP, up to 38 molecules of ATP per molecule of glucose. Whew, a lot of, a lot of information there, but again, just uh, keep the big picture in mind. This is how cells essentially make energy. In the subsequent videos, we're going to look specifically at carbohydrates, proteins, and lipids, and their metabolism, um, what uh, cells can do with them, and then we'll look at how all of the body, energy, and so forth is orchestrated via different hormones and the nervous system.